As I was driving in this morning, I noticed 21 people and six dogs exercising. Isn't that great? 21 people, six dogs, got up early, no cats, on a Sunday. Now, if that ratio gets shifted and it's like 21 dogs and six people, we might have a problem in Windsor, but um, I thought it was interesting. Now, in my neighborhood in Water Valley, people drive golf carts around, so sometimes I see them walking the dog from the golf cart. (laughs) Is it just me or is that just wrong? on many levels. I'm sure they have an injury or a hip or something and the dog needs walked. I'm sure that's what it is. But what occurred to me is there are people out exercising, doing a good thing. You guys are here exercising spiritually. You've carved out time on a Sunday morning to exercise spiritually. And when we talk about small groups and community, that is more time to carve out, to invest in your spiritual walk and your spiritual relationships. And today I want to talk about friendships. You think about some of the sitcoms that have been out there, especially Friends, um, some of you that that are older cheers. uh, They're they're all kind of the same, aren't they? But everybody wants relationship. Everybody longs for something more. Everyone longs for great um, friends and great relationships. And I think it's super important. And the main reason I think it's super important is because I think the friends that you have can, can change the trajectory of your life. Like, like they will influence every arena of your life, if you think about it. They can influence in a positive way. Now, the flip side of that is if you don't have very good friends, they can, you know, affect your life in, I mean, it can be miserable, uh, there can be pain that you, you can't even imagine with the wrong friends. How many of you, exp- you know what I'm talking about? You're thinking of some people now. And so that's why I want to talk about friendships and about us being a good friend and what that, what that looks like. Um, Pastor Craig Grishel says, show me your friends and I will show you your future. Show me your friends and I will show you your future. Our key verse for this morning is from Proverbs 13:20. And it says this, it says, walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm. Meaning, if you do life with people who are smarter than you, more loving than you, have more peace, have a better marriage than you, handle their finances better than you, um, you will become like them. You will become better at these areas. You hang around with people that have a closer relationship with Jesus than you. um, They are going to bring up your average. Now, on on the other side of that, if you do life with people who are full of pride and rebellious, as Rick mentioned, and liars and bullies and complainers, and, um, you know, people who gossip all the time, um, people who are the opposite of peacemakers, they're just kind of stirring things up all the time, Um, people who are selfish. It doesn't say you will become like them. What does it say? You'll get hurt. Isn't that interesting? You're going to get hurt. You're headed for some pain in your life. If you surround your your friend, people like that around you, you know what grandma used to say, who you're running with. You know, who are those people you're running with? When I think about my own life, any success that that I've had, um, I can, I can connect to people who were my friends, people who were willing to call me out when I needed to be called out, people who would say the hard stuff to me, people who, who loved me no matter what I was going through. Uh, my wife has changed the trajectory of my life. Some teachers that I can think about, um, some staff members that, that I've had the opportunity to work with. And, and some of you have friends that have done the same thing for you. They've made you better because of who they are. They influenced you by their example and and wise counsel and tough love and grace and acceptance when I make mistakes. And when I think about the times I got into trouble, I rarely get into trouble alone. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, usually, especially like high school, college, I didn't get in trouble. Think about the last time you were really in trouble you probably weren't by yourself. Now, maybe. 
But usually you do that with some people. So here's what we're going to do. Find a piece of paper, a pen, pull out your smartphone, um, and, and I want you to list your five closest friends. Do we have Jeopardy music or something? Just list out your five closest friends. Now, you can't use your spouse. Some of you are already scratching. Can't put your dog. Five closest friends. Some of you aren't moving. Five closest friends. These are the people who you can call at 3 a.m. when you need help. These are the people, this is who you would call to bail you out of jail. Five closest friends. These are people who know stuff about you and you know stuff about them and that stuff stays in the vault, right? Like the Cold War. They got missiles, we got missiles, nobody's gonna push the button because we, they know too much about me and I know too much about them. Those are those kinds of friends. When I took Amber over to Africa to meet with Scott Harris, who's our missionary there, um, he and I grew up together. There are pictures of us in, in a bathtub as little babies. taking a, That's how far back we go. And Amber said, Scott, do you have some stories about my dad? And Scott said, yes, I have lots of stories about your dad, but I'm not telling them to you because I don't want him to tell the stories that he knows about me to my kids. Those are the kind of friends we're talking about. They know things about you. They know where the bodies are buried in the history of your journey. Now, on the flip side, they know your potential. They celebrate with you. They see things in you that no one else sees. They call it out. They look you in the eye and say, I believe in you. You're going to get through this. We're going to get through this together. Now, here's what studies have shown. You are the average of your five closest friends. Isn't that interesting? You are the average of your five closest friends. Whatever arena of life, you know, Dave Ramsey, the financial guru, he talks about, you know, if you're just hanging around with broke people all the time, you're going to be broke too. You got to get around some people that know how to handle money. You are the average of your five closest friends. Politically, you're probably the average of your five closest friends. How you do God and faith. You know, if, if you're just chasing hard after Jesus, chances are you got a couple of friends who are chasing hard after Jesus. If you were drunk last night, chances are, Five closest friends. Maybe you're a video gamer, addicted to video games. Chances are a few of your, your, five, your closest friends are too. I looked at a few stats. I thought it was interesting. Um, it said that 40% of gamers admit that it's a way for them to escape from the real world. And I thought it was like young people, but the average male gamer is 33 years old. Isn't that interesting? And the average female gamers, 37 years old. It's an escape from real relationship. Whatever your thing is, we all have them. We, we, we have things in our lives that allow us to escape from authentic, real relationship. In the area of parenting, average of your five closest friends, morally, morality. I find it interesting if if, if you get called out morally on something, I watch how people react. They either go and try to find other people to surround themselves with that kind of would agree with them, or they go and try to find a group of people that are doing better and say, I want to hang around these guys and learn how to do better. It says a lot about a person's character, doesn't it? Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. Look at your friends and see your future. When it comes to following Jesus, do you have friends that help you with that? Or do you have friends that hinder you from that? And I'm not saying, you know, if you've been around here a while, I'm not saying that we just completely disconnect from the world. We love our friends out there. But there's a balance. And by the way, if you met someone in church and, and you think that, that automatically means they're a good influence on you. Um, it's not true. 
Because we have a lot of messy people here, right? I'm a messy person. You're a messy person. So don't just assume that. I've had people call me and like, well, I met that guy in church and what's going on? So average of your closest friends. So here's the definition of a friend. Proverbs 17, 17 from the FBV version. A friend is someone you may or may not know who accepts your friend request. This person's primary job in the relationship is to make you feel good about yourself by liking and commenting positively about your posts. That's from the Facebook version. That's not really in there. Some of you are going, where's that? <laughs> Doesn't say that. Here's what it really says from the NIV. Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for a time of adversity. Real friends love all the time. Not some of the time, all the time. And if you have a couple friends like that, oh man, it's like gold. Hang on to them, latch on to them. Cultivate that relationship. And if you don't, God has something for you. He has someone for you. He has something better for you. They'll walk you through the hard times. They tell you the hard stuff. They say the hard things that no one else is willing to say. And, and when you find yourself in just in a rough place, they don't try to you know, tell you how you got there, right? They just say, hey, let's walk through this together. We're going to get through this. Wouldn't it be amazing if, if you had four or five friends who loved you at all times your entire life like this? No matter what, no matter what time of the day it is, you say to them, go away, I'm fine. They know you too good for that. They're like, no, I'm not going anywhere. One of the problems is that studies show that most of us only have about two close friends. How many of you don't have five? I don't. I didn't put five down. I have to raise my hand. Only about two. 25 years ago, culturally, we had about six close friends. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Some of it's social media. Social media, I mean, I love social media, but it was intended to kind of supplement our friendships and make them better. And in a lot of ways, it has kind of taken away from true, authentic relationship because real friendship takes work. It takes effort. It takes time. It takes being real. Friendship is not built by a snapshot and time posted to, to all your friends that defines you. That, that's a placebo for friendship. And our society is more alone than ever. And yet, we were made by God for so much more. Aristotle had an attractive expression to, to capture the thought. He says, close friends share salt together. It, it's not just that they, they sit together passing the salt across the table. It's that they sit with one another across the course of their lives, sharing its savor, its moments, bitter and sweet. He says that the desire for friendship comes quickly, but friendship does not. It takes work. It takes time. And in the balance of our time, I want to talk about two ways that we can be great friends. Two ways that you can be a great friend. The first one is that you got to be present. you got to be present. There's no substitute for being present. Face to face. How many times have you been at a restaurant and you see a family of four and what are they doing? I don't think they're texting each other. Small group leaders, put the phones away in your small group. It's an hour. Put the phones away. Be present with your friends. I think if, if you show up and you're not present, it, it, it can do more damage than good. One of the things I like about Becky Olmsted, some of you know Becky, is when we would have meetings in Fort Collins, and it was kind of my turn to talk and share what's going on in Windsor, um, she would pull out a little, little notepad and a pen and just lean in. And I'm like, I'm not going to say anything that important. 
It made me feel so special. She was present. Like, I don't know if she really took notes, but it looked good. There's something incredibly powerful about being physically and emotionally present. Can I pray for you right now? There's incredible power in that. We can pray for you. There's lots of ways you can send a prayer request in on, online. You can write it on your card. You can put a sticker on the cross back there. But there's something powerful about going back there and having another person put a hand on your shoulder and pray for you. Being present. One of my favorite verses, I'll talk about it till I die, is Hebrews 10, 24. It says, let us consider, meaning let us plan and think out and strategize and make priority. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And that word spur is so out of context. The writer of Hebrews just like grabbed this from way over here and and inserted it. You know what it means? It, It means to provoke or irritate. Don't you love that? Let us get together and provoke and irritate each other toward love and good deeds. I love that picture. And he says, let us not give up meeting together as some are already in the habit of doing. 2,000 years ago, they were already in the habit of not meeting together. And, And the writer says, be careful. Be careful. You need to be together in community. Let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Provoke, irritate, have a plan, carve out time, make it a priority. When was the last time you got with a, another group of people and said, hey, let's just, let's just do something to make all of us better or let's do something to make someone else better or let's do something together that makes Jesus famous. Let's do that. Power of presence. I don't know how many times I've showed up to a hospital room. Some of you, it was yours. Person's dying. Person's in bad shape. I feel so inadequate. I don't know what to say. Everyone's looking at me. Well, you're the pastor. Say something. Pray something. Do something. And I'm just like, "Ah, I don't know. God help me, God help me, God help me. And I'll just like vomit something, prayer out, you know. And I'm walking out of there thinking, well, that was terrible. They're probably worse now than they were where I came by. A couple weeks later, I'll get a note. You know what you said was just perfect. It's just what we needed. That's not me. If that's God, tell him I'll be right with him. Um, you know, that's not me. That's, that's God and his presence. But a lot of it's just showing up. You know, I think 95% of being an awesome friend is just showing up and being there, being present. Sometimes they're just glad that I brought Wendy to the hospital. Thanks for driving her. <laughs> you can go wait out there and have a soda. Something about a hand on a shoulder, eye to eye. I believe in you. You're going to get through this. And you don't have to do it alone. I remember a couple who would show up at our kids' sporting events sometimes. They had their little lawn chairs and everything. And what was interesting is they didn't even like sports. It's like, you guys don't even understand what's going on. You, 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 you don't even like sports. Why, why are you here? I'd say, because we like you, and we like Wendy. Being present. Number two, and my final point, you got to be open. You got to be transparent. I know for some of you guys, that's hard. I don't like that any more than you do. But you got to be open. Hey, don't be too transparent in the first meeting, okay? That can be pretty crazy destructive too. You know, there's a new growing phobia. You know what it is? It's talking on the phone. It's talking on the phone. 
We have a whole generation that doesn't want to talk on the phone. How many of you, you know, you let it go to voicemail and then you text back? Yeah. And what studies are showing is we don't know how to talk on the phone. We, we, we don't know how to do that kind of relationship because it's dynamic and I can't control it. I can control a text, but what if you ask me a question or, and, and they're saying some people don't know how to end the conversation. So it just freaks them out. I don't know how to stop this conversation. We have to be open. We have to be transparent. James 5.16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. You know what I see there? I see two ingredients. I see showing up, being together, close proximity, and being vulnerable. And what happens when we do this? That Greek word is, is made whole. We're made complete. Isn't that interesting? We're healed. Want to be a good friend? Got to open up. You also need to say you're sorry when you're wrong. Some of my closest relationships started out with me saying I'm sorry because I was wrong. Some of you parents need to say you're sorry to your kids. Maybe there's someone in this room that you need to say you're sorry to before we get out of here. I heard about a guy who'd say to his wife, I'm sorry. She'd say, what for? And he'd say, I don't know, but something will come up. That's kind of how I operate. Pastor Grishel says, you might impress people with your strengths, but we connect with people through our weakness. You might impress people with your strengths, but you connect with people at a deep level through weakness. The truth is we were created to live in community with close friends. And if you don't have any friends you're sitting there right now, I, I don't have, I, there's nobody on my list. It's okay. There's still time. And I think it starts by just asking God to show you. It might start by just creating a little bit of space and taking a risk and being vulnerable again. I know some of you tried relationship. You got beat up. Got beat up by a church person. Got beat up by somebody. I'm sorry. I just want to say I'm sorry. But um, don't let that let you stop trying. Because there's so much incredible richness and blessing if you'll step out and risk again. And it really is risk. Because we're all messy, right? So it is a risk. And it is messy. And it is hard. But it's so Incredibly worth it. Join a small group. Find a coffee buddy. Find a walking buddy. We have some of the most awesome walking trails around here and the most beautiful sunsets. Find a walking buddy and discuss spiritual things with them. Ask them, hey, has God showed you anything this week? Is there anything I can be praying for you? How are you doing with this? How are you doing with that? Be a mentor. Find a mentor. Find a married couple that, that will meet with you once or twice a month and just let you ask questions. You are the average of your five closest friends. So find people who will bring that average up. Let's stand. I just want to pray for you. Um, here at the Vineyard, if this is your first time, this is uh, what we call, um, what do we call it? Response time. And this is just a time where you can respond. We've carved out time for you to respond to whatever God's been speaking to you this morning. Maybe he was speaking to you on the way in. Sometimes he does that. It has nothing to do with anything I said. That's awesome. Lean into that. Take a step in that direction. During this time, uh, I encourage you to uh, Go back, we've got a prayer team back there that would love to pray for you and it can be about anything. 
We have communion prepared in the front and the back. And if you've given Jesus a steering wheel to your life, we invite you to come and take communion with us. We have our offering boxes on the back wall. And around here, we believe that giving is an act of worship. Trusting God with our finances. So you can do that. And then AJ is going to lead us in some worship songs. And I just encourage you to really think about the words and, and make these a song from you, from your heart to God. So Father, I thank you for today. And I invite your Holy Spirit to come right now and be present. You want to be present with us. You don't want to be this distant God that we see someday. You want to be present now and, and all week. So we invite your presence here. You are a relational God. We give you permission to just do business in our hearts. Father, help us to be good friends to others. And for those who are here today, they're just, they just feel so alone. I just pray that you will fill some of that void and that you'll bring someone along that can be a special friend to them. Thank you for who you are and all that you're doing in this place, in us and through us, in this community and beyond. And now we want to worship you in spirit and in truth simply because you're worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen.